I am excited to be here. I, I, uh, this weekend experience, uh, uh, I don't know, not this weekend, but a few days leading up to this, uh, thought I was uh, going to have kidney stones or something. Anyway, went through a process, didn't know what would happen, didn't know if this was happening, but thank the Lord, here I am, and don't know what it was, but it's gone, and I hope it stays gone, right? Uh, did have hiccups for about 18 hours, so if it happens again, just humor me, and I'll get through this, all right? But uh, thank the Lord that they're gone and, and, and may stay gone. Uh, someone asked me this morning, how you feeling? I said, well, it's kind of a... Uh, I, I have mixed feelings, I guess. You know, I'm, I'm as nervous as a long-tailed cat in a room full of rocking chairs. You've heard that probably. But I said, I'm also so excited. I'm as excited as a little puppy. And both of those things are bad, if you know what I mean. All right? Uh, but I am excited to be here this morning. All right? I'm always excited to uh, share God's Word with you. Um, you know... 20 years ago, uh, uh, something happened that never, never left my mind, and probably more like 25 years ago. Uh, but uh, back in the day when I was in construction work, uh, eating over in Frisco, had my favorite restaurant there for me and the crew, and, and it was this Chinese restaurant over there called Golden Moon. Uh, man, it, it, it was a place to go now, a nice buffet. Uh, it was hard on working afterwards, but... Uh, it was it was good, but I was there, and uh, me and my guys were having lunch. The uh, place was packed every single day. Large dining rooms uh, there. We were in kind of the back dining room, fairly large. Every table was full. A uh, young man just stood up in the middle. He had the center table with some other guys there, some other construction workers, and he just stood up, stood up in the middle of the dining room. And he was a painter. He had his painter whites on. And he just stood up and he says, my name is so-and-so. And he says, for the last eight years of my life, I've been incarcerated. And he said, I've been serving time for the crimes that I have committed. And he said, I have served that time. And he says, I have been reformed. And I have been released. And most importantly... I have been redeemed. And he said, in my time in prison, he said, I have come to faith in Jesus Christ. And he said, Jesus has now set me on a path that I am experiencing life and abundant life. And he says, I want to share with you and everyone around me what Jesus has done for me. And he said, I want to encourage you, if you don't know Jesus Christ, to place your faith in Jesus Christ. And he says, learn and see and experience the life of Jesus Christ. And I thought to myself, wow, that was awkward. Uh, I, I was looking around at the people there, and, and, and I believe the people may have gave him 15, 20 seconds of their time, maybe. And, 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 and when he got to the point about Jesus Christ and all, they, they kind of began to talk a little bit amongst themselves and they began to eat again. He didn't take over a minute and a half or whatever and he sat back down. But I just thought to myself, wow, that was, that was kind of strange, man. Uh, mm. But I, I'm not sure if that gentleman ever had second thoughts uh, about how effective his methods was in encouraging people to consider a relationship with Jesus Christ. But I know one thing. He shined the light of Jesus. That morning. At that time. And, and it's, never, it's never left me. And that's just something you don't see that much anymore. Uh, you may see street preachers. You may see some other folks going out and, and witnessing. Uh, but that was just something different. And as awkward as it was at that moment. Uh, it seems like a beautiful thing right now uh, to me. You know, uh, as I begin to think about that, this week as the Lord has led me uh, to my scriptures, and uh, I begin to do a little uh, searching, I guess, but I, I went to Barna Research, Barna, a group of people that does research in the Christian life, 
And uh, uh, Barna had a, a, a poll out there, some research out there that caught my eye. And, and it says, the signs of decline. And I just thought, oh my goodness. Uh, uh, you know, I felt a, a change take place over the last couple of years. It's probably no secret to you who are church uh, goers and church attenders. Uh, the church has, has dropped off in the last two years, ever since the pandemic. Uh, 2000, it, it declined greatly. But as I began to look at Barna's research, I began to see how Americans relate to Christianity and how it's changing, all right? Uh, one, of the, one of the little um, polls, uh, 103,000 people uh, over uh, 1993 to 2020, uh, weekly church attendance went, uh, they, there's, a, there's a three groups of people, Christian, practicing Christians, non-practicing, and non-Christian, but it says uh, 45% weekly church attendance, 93. It's down to 29% in 2020. Uh, weekly church attendance by generation, all right? We always like to look, I always like to point the finger at the millennials or uh, Gen X or or whoever, <laughs> whoever that might be other than us, right? Uh, it says here that, that Gen X, all right? No, let me go with elders. Elders first, all right? Started out at 51%, and this is in 2003, 51%, and now they're at 37%, all right? This is 96,000 Christians uh, that they polled here. Uh, boomers. All right, boomers started out at, at, at 48%. They're down to 27% right now. Uh, Gen X, 20, uh, 34% to 29%. Uh, millennials started at 32% or down to 25%. Church attendance is falling. Church attendance is declining within the Christian community. I, I kept reading there, and I come across another, uh, another title of one. I went ahead and read it, but the title says 56% of Christians feel that their spiritual life is entirely private. That was hard for me to understand. From what I have experienced, from what I've seen, like the young man that stood up, that had, that had been redeemed Knows what, it, knows what it is to be in captivity and then to be set free to experience life. And that's what Jesus has done for you and I. And that led me to the scriptures this morning. Matthew 5, if you have your Bibles, please turn with me to Matthew 5. If you've got a phone, you've got your scriptures on it. They say there's nothing better than that warm glow of the Holy Spirit. So... Just bring it up. Bring it up. We'll go to Matthew 5. All right. It's, a, it's the Beatitudes that will be, uh, or the Sermon on the Mount. I'm sorry, that we'll be, we'll be looking at. This is where the Sermon on the Mount begins. All right. Sermon on the Mount goes chapter 5, chapter 6, and chapter 7 of Matthew. And, and uh, uh, this morning, uh, we want to look at. At this scripture here, and, and, and all of these scriptures here, argue, arguably, uh, some of the best teachings of Jesus Christ, the, the words and the teachings uh, all together as Matthew has uh, compiled them for us here. Uh, Jesus had begun his public ministry here, and he'd been teaching uh, in the synagogues, he'd been teaching all throughout uh, the area there, and and. He was drawing quite the crowds as he began to heal people, as he began to teach with authority, as he began to uh, feed people. Uh, they began to follow Jesus and they began to hang out. In other words, the word had got out about Jesus Christ. And so as Jesus was there that morning and he looked and he saw the crowds of people. He began to ease up on the side of the mountain there, uh, looking over that, that area, that part of the Sea of Galilee there. And up on the side of the hill, he took his seat, and his disciples came to him and sat down. 
And, 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 and Jesus was there and he began to teach his disciples. Now we know that there were others there. Uh, it wasn't only his disciples, but, but he had a crowd of followers around him. A, a crowd that might not have been his true followers already at that time, but possibly some of his followers to be, okay. But they were definitely overhearers. Uh, that were there, and they began to crowd around, I'm sure, as well. But Jesus began by explaining to them that uh, these are the attitudes. Uh, this is what it's like for my followers. Uh, this is the behaviors that my followers will have. Those that are living a life of acceptance of God's invitation into his kingdom, right? His kingdom of heaven. Now that, that's verses 3 through, uh, three through 10 there. And that's what we call the, the beatitude, all right? These are descriptions of the character qualities of the citizens uh, of his followers of Jesus Christ. Now I wonder if we read those descriptions there that if we were to do a self-evaluation, do we, do we find ourselves there as poor in the spirit? Uh, maybe uh, uh, those who mourn, uh, those who are meek, and, and those who hunger and thirst for righteousness and merciful. Uh, I wonder if we find ourselves having some of those qualities. You see, he continues to explain to them. That if you're a child of God, that if you're a follower of mine, that you'll have these qualities in your life. You see, at the end of the section there, after he tells them about how they should live, Jesus had been bringing this up slowly but surely. He had been uh, talking to the Pharisees and the scribes. He'd been pointing out different things. And, and Jesus was telling them, you know what, guys? The life that I'm coming to, to bring is a life that's, 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 that's over and above. And he gets to this point here and he begins to lay it out. And soon you begin to find out that it's just not over and above, but it is above and beyond the way and the laws that's there and the way that Jesus is calling them to live. Verse 11, he says, Blessed are you when people insult you persecute you and falsely say all kind of evils against you because of me. Blessed are you when people insult you, when they falsely accuse you of things because of me. Now he just went through these wonderful qualities here, these characteristics in their lives. And when he, when he says, blessed are you when they do this, and he says, to rejoice and be glad. You know, I'm not sure blessed is how we feel. I'm not sure that, that if we have these character qualities in our life, I, I'm not sure that, that that makes sense that we ought to be persecuted. You know, shouldn't the people that live this way, isn't that the ones that we ought to stand up and give an applause, stand up and, 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 and say, man, we see that. Thank you. We see that. And there are people who receive applause for living in this manner. There are people who are noticed living in this way. You and I notice them. And it's a good thing. But Jesus says, when you live in this way for me, you see, there's a difference there when we live this way for Jesus Christ. You know, people gave that young man his attention. Until he mentioned the word of Jesus Christ and how he identified with Jesus Christ. And I believe the attention began to get short at that point in time. They began to turn and began to eat at that time. And that's where it changed through there. Jesus says when we're persecuted, we should rejoice. We should be glad. You know, and I'm not sure rejoicing and being glad is our first response either. I'm not sure that's how we act, Right? When attack comes to us, I believe our first response for most of us is probably either to fight or to flight. And I think that's true probably for all of us. The first thing that we feel is, is what? What would you say? You know? 
You insult me? How dare you? We're going we're to stand up and blow up, right? That's what we're going to do. Or maybe we'll have a tendency to just withdraw. Maybe, maybe we'll, we'll tell ourselves, all I want to do is get out of here, right? It could have went down bad. You may have been witnessing for the Lord. You may have been trying to do something, and, and all of a sudden you felt the pressures, and, all, and it just clammed you up. You shut down, and the next thing you knew, you wanted to get out of there. We've all had those feelings, right? Maybe we want to just go into our little protective shell, just withdraw in. And either way, what we're going to do is we're going to do balance from a, I mean, battle from a defensive stance, right? But Jesus is telling us, he says, no, that's not what I'm going to allow. It's not what I'm going to allow for my followers. It's not what I want from you. It's what he's telling his disciples. Now, he's got some other folks overhearing this. And they're going, oh, man, what's he talking about? The disciples are sitting and listening. Let's look at our text that we're here this morning to look at. We're going to look at Matthew 5, verses 13 through 16. Jesus finished there with, with 12. Uh, he finishes there with 12 and saying, Rejoice and be glad. Because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who, went, who were before you. Verse 13. But you are salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything. Except to be thrown out and trampled by men. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they light it. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. You see, Jesus says, that's that's what I want from you. You see, I want my children not to withdraw, not to stand up and blow up, but I want my children to engage, not retreat. Not even when times get tough. You see, we have this temptation to withdraw when we're persecuted, when we're insulted. Somebody said something we don't like, so you know what? I'm not going back to that place. What we're really saying is, God, I don't care what your plans for me was. I don't want to have nothing to do with your plans today or tomorrow or next week. And that's not a good thing to do. When we pull back, when we shut down, we just want to go into a place that we're, where, where we can feel safe. But it's happened to you, hasn't it? It's happened to me. Jesus says no. People of my kingdom has got a very special role to play in this world. Especially when this world persecutes them. You see, we're to be like salt and light in this world. Now, there's a great lesson for us there. There's a great lesson. A lesson that I think we've forgotten in these last 20 years. Last 20 years where we have fallen to come to the house of the Lord. To where other things in this world has filled our time and filled our days and filled our weeks with the things of this world. A man asked me one time, he says, when's the last time that you've allowed God to do anything great through you? Scared me to death. I, I, I not sure God's ever done anything great through me. I don't know. But that wasn't the point he was making. It was, it was me allowing God to work in me. Giving God the opportunity. And I believe that's the, that's the reason for this decline. That's the reason for this number. Guys, we've forgotten who we are in Christ. We sit at the table of the world, we eat from the world's table, filling ourselves 
from the things of the world and were too full for anything of God. And we need to change some things. There's an urgency in our time. You see, Jesus is reminding us that our spiritual battle and our discipleship life in this world is not just for our benefit. So much about what we do in this world and the time that we spend is all about us. If it's not about us, it's about our family. And that's more important. But God says, you're my child and I've left you here for a purpose. And it's an intended purpose. Part of the reason that God wants to work in your life is so that you can do good for others. It's not all about you. God has put us here on this earth and most importantly, God has left us here in this world so that He can, only, he can, he can work in us and He can work through us by doing good for others. To be salt and light in this world. You know, I think many times in our heart, many times in our actions, I think we can have a desire just to ride off this world. You may have felt it. I've heard it said many times. Oh, this world's going to hell and it don't like me much and I don't like it much. So I'm done with it. We've had that attitude if we hadn't said those very words, right? Well, it's a dark world and I, I'm, it's always been dark, guys. That's why Jesus came to this earth. To a dark, dark world. It was dark then and it was, it's dark now. You see, this is not the attitude that Jesus wants us to have. And we can see that in verses 3 through 11. That's not the attitude he wants. Jesus says, get out there and be the salt and the light of the earth. And Jesus uses these two great examples here. And, and, and if we were to look at salt, what, what do you think the big deal is about salt, especially in the time of Jesus? You know, we know that salt was a very valuable commodity in Jesus' time. Very valuable commodity. At times it would even be used as a form of payment. I don't, I don't know what to think now. If next, next month I, I get my check and it's just all salt. <laughs> right? And what would we think? You know, what in the world are you thinking? But, but they, you know, soldiers. Soldiers would step up, receive their payment there, and they'd give them this little pouch of salt. They'd go about their way. That's how valuable it was. They could take that salt and they could resell it. They could trade it. They could take that salt and it would supply all of the needs that they had. All right? You know, back, back years ago, there were people that would barter. Barter with a lot of things, right? It wasn't just a, a money. It'd be chickens. It'd be all kinds of things. It didn't matter. It had value, but salt was extremely valuable in Jesus' day. Very precious Commodity. You ever heard the old saying, worth your salt? I remember my dad saying many times, son, you're not worth your salt. <laughs> it's, it's a negative part of the hat, right? That means you better change your attitude. You better step it up a little bit, you know? That's where that came from. Jesus is telling us, Christ follower, child of mine, you're precious. You're precious to this world. You're valuable to my plan. You're valuable to my purpose. There's another reason, kind of a primary reason. Uh, that was an important reason. Might not have been the primary reason. Just as important though, the salt had a, a, a preservation quality to it. You see, salt was used to preserve their meats. Back in Jesus' day, if you ate meat, you ate it two ways. One way was fresh. You may have butchered it, killed it, whatever it was, and, and, and you ate the meat immediately. But if you didn't, you packed it in salt. You preserved it. You preserved it. 
Our day is not custom to that, right? We're not custom to preserving our meat, our food in salt. That doesn't mean it doesn't happen today. Now, there's places around the world today to where they still use salt. Much of the meat that we get that's salted heavily, it comes from these times. But in Jesus' day, if you didn't pack your meat in salt, it rotted. And it doesn't take long for meat to spoil. I don't know about you, but, but I've been around rotten meat. It's not very pleasant to be around, is it? No, it's not, not, not pleasant, much less to try to eat. So it's a preservative. And Jesus says, you're the salt of the earth. Do you think there's things in this world that Jesus wants us to preserve? That we can help preserve? I think there's plenty of things. Uh, you know, think about the relationships that we have. It seems that the older, older I get, the more clear it becomes is that life is about relationships. It truly is. And the earlier you figure that out, <laughs> the better you'll be at preserving those relationships. Relationships like our families. There's nothing more important than to preserve the relationships in our families. Nothing more important. And yet at times, we got warped thinking. We think we're helping and all we're doing is hurting. We think we're, we're trying to do what's best, and it's not what's best. You know, I see many times, many times, we don't, we don't always know what God's doing in the life of another. And there's a lot of times that life, God may be trying to tear down a life so that he can build it back up in his strength. And yet we jump in and want to save it. We jump in and want to do what's best. And yet that may not be what's best. We need to know what God is asking of us. What about the, uh, our friends, our neighbors, our church family? The relationship within God's people in God's house. God's body. When somebody hurts your feelings... We don't pack up and leave, take our marbles and go home. We make it known. We go to them and we talk. We say, you offended me. And they say, I didn't know that. I'm sorry. Forgive me. You're forgiven. I love you. I love you. Now let's go back to work. But yet when we withdraw and leave, tensions go. It, it doesn't happen. It's not preserved. We're not being the salt of the world. Our employers, relationships with the people we work for, the relationship of those that work for us, the reputation of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, I'm thinking about that organization bunch, thinking about the school district over there. Our relationship with the school district it is one that is, is, is so good, so sweet. Don't want to ever see anything happen to that. We want to preserve that, and so we're blessing them. As you didn't know, we're serving pizzas over there for every teacher, every employee, every administrator, every employee of this ISD this month. 19th and 20th of this month. Guys, that's over 250 pizzas. We're going to shine the light of Jesus by being a pizza delivery man. All right? We're preserving that relationship. Listen, within that preservation of quality also comes a healing aspect. Salt has a healing aspect, guys. And that's why we have to preserve things right. That's why we have to do things right. That's why we have to allow the Lord to work and to move. 
He brings the healing. It's not us that heals. It's God that heals. There's hurts. And there's wounds. Are your words and our actions helping or healing? I mean helping or destroying? Anybody ever use Epsom salts? Is that something still used today? Yeah. Yeah. It's great stuff. Yeah. Got magical powers to heal those infections. There's healing in forgiveness. There's healing in forgiveness giving. There's healing in forgiveness received. There's healing just in a, a polite, quiet, quiet words. There's healing that takes place. You never know how somebody's hurting. You never know. How you doing? I'm fine. Inside, they're not fine. They're hurting. They're hurting deeply. That's why our life teams and small groups are so good. Guys, that's, that's where church happens. We come here to give back to the Lord. Church happens in those small groups when you know what's going on in people's lives. You can support them and you can pray for them. You can lift them up. You can come alongside them. You know when they're having anxiety. You know when they're stressing out. You know when there's needs there. You know when there's troubles there. And you're there to be used. Or you're there to be lifted up and surrounded and held up. There's healing. Salt also has an enhancing quality. But we're all too familiar with that enhancing, that flavor, right? Yeah, it, 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 it enhances the taste of food, right? We know that. You know, many, many of you love your salt too much. And I, I, I watch some of you put salt on stuff. You, you salt your food before you even taste it. it, it you know, I just got to have my salt. Put it on there. But Jesus says to us that we're the salt of the earth. And we're precious to this world. And God wants to use you in this world to make this world a better place. A purer place. You see, salt also has a, a, a purity, a pure quality about it. You know, they received, they got salt from two, two separate places at this time. And, and, and one that they didn't use for, was from the Dead Sea. Had too many impurities in it. All right? They couldn't use it. You don't use contaminated salt. It's not good for anything. Right? God wants to use us to be in salt. God has called us to preserve, to enhance all that is good and all that is glorifying to God. We can help our families. We can help this community. We can help our world be a better place if we function as God has intended us to be. Salt's just not our job. It's our function. All right? I don't know that it's our mission totally, but it's our function. That's how we function as as the salt of the earth. We need to be salty. Colossians 4. Paul says here. Uh, verses 2 through 5. He says devote yourselves to prayer. Being watchful and thankful. And pray for us too. That God may open the door for our message. So that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ. For which I am in chains. Proclaim, uh, Pray that I may proclaim it clearly. As I should. You know, I think we've become contaminated. I think we've become deluded. I think Barna's poles are in such a way because of these reasons. But Paul says you need to be in prayer daily. We need to be in communication with God daily. You know, how, how stressed out are you about your days to where, where you sleep to the last moment, slap the alarm three or four times, and then you're late getting up, getting ready, getting out of the house, getting to work, and you never once take time to say, good morning, Lord. Good morning. God, help me this day. Help me to be mindful of what you want from me. Help me to be mindful of those that are around me. Help me to be sensitive, God, when you want me to say something. We need to be in communication with the Lord. Paul says, be watchful, be thankful. We don't only need to pray for ourselves, we need to pray for others. 
I love how Paul says, pray for us. Pray for us. Why? So that God will open the door for the message. You know, in the morning we say, God, use me today. Use me, Father. Speak the truth to someone that needs to hear the truth. Help me to give an encouraging word to one that needs to be encouraging. Help me to, help me to give somebody some hope in this world. Verse 5, he says, Be wise in the way that you act toward outsiders and make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation always be full of grace, seasoned with what? Salt. So that you may know how to answer everyone. I love that. What a, what a, what a great reminder for us. We need to be careful how we act toward outsiders. There are people watching you each and every day, watching how you take things, watching how you live Watching how you act, watching how you talk, listening to how you talk. We need to be careful. We need to be wise, making the most of every opportunity. I can remember one man walking in my office and said, I'm here this morning, just got out of jail in Oklahoma City. I walked all the way here from Oklahoma City. And he said, I saw your cross from the sidewalk down there. And he said, I thought I'd just come in and find out if you've got anything better for me than what the world has to offer. And if you don't, I've got a bullet at home waiting on me. I'm telling you, you better make the most of that opportunity. Did I want to just crawl inside my protective shell? I, absolutely. I said, oh, Lord. Kind of like Pastor Vince, Lord, help me now. <laughs> you better help me now, Lord, right? That's exactly right. God, I, I don't have a clue to say. I said, brother, all I know is you need Jesus. I've never been through what you've been through, but you need Jesus. Jesus can help you. Jesus can, can take care of that. The hope is in Jesus, not in what I have for you. What I can tell you, it's Jesus. An hour and a half later, he was on his knees crying out to the Lord and accepting Jesus Christ. Make the most of every opportunity. One author put it, we need, to, we need to live with tact. I love that. Need to live with tact. What is tact? Well, as we do life, we should live tactful. Tact is the ability to deliver a difficult message in a way that considers other people's feelings and preserves the relationship. It's discretion. It's compassion. And it's courtesy. Many times we'll say, you know, I don't care what people think. That guy needed to hear what I had to say. You need to care what people think. You need to. God cares. God cares what they think. God cares how you say it, how you deliver it. He cares about the heart behind the delivery. You see, that's, that's, a whole, that's the whole secret by being salt. That's from where it comes from. And when we're delivering things that come out of our mouth that is not to edifying and building up of others, then it's no more than just poison. It's not of God. Matter of fact, it's a sin against God. It doesn't matter whether it comes through our mouth or comes through our fingers. That's a whole other level of being salt of the earth this year. The digital moments that we're in. Some of the reason for the decline in attendance. Some of this instant, instant, instant connection stuff, hyper connection, they called it. Same way with disconnection. Boop, done with you. Look at what it said in verse 13b. Look at the last part of, of 13 there. But if salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. Salt loses its saltiness and it occurs when it's diluted, when it's contaminated. It also occurs when it's been used. Pack that meat, pull that meat down, shake the salt off of it and eat your meat. You don't reuse that salt. It's thrown out. But when we lose our saltiness, guys, you, 
it, what it boils down to is, guys, we don't get up every day and we don't carry our cross daily. We don't carry it daily wholeheartedly. We get up and profess. We claim. But we need to carry our cross daily to remind us each and every day that we're one of God's children. When we do that, listen, when the world sees you in those manners, you're not shining a clear light to the world. It blurs the vision of Christ. It blurs that vision of the kingdom. It's contaminated by the things of the world. It's deluded. That's why we need to pray. God, help me. Help me today. God also uses a metaphor of light. Matthew 14. He tells them, he says, you're the light of the world. Light is a very common metaphor in the Bible along with darkness. And light's often used to, to contract, uh, contrast knowledge and ignorance. All right? Here it, it stands for the world's opportunity to perceive the truth about Jesus. You see, this world is dark about God. It's dark about God. And we as Christians are left here to turn the lights on. You know? We use lights each and every day. It'd be foolish for us right now just to go ahead and turn them all off while we're in here, wouldn't it? It would be foolish. You know? I, I, I can remember talking to people who were very analytical and, and, and they, you try to share the gospel with them and they just couldn't make sense of it. Well, this didn't matter. They had to go back and connect A, B, B all the way back. And I told one old boy one time, he's asking me some questions and I knew the guy. And I said, for goodness sakes, guy, I, I don't understand where the electricity comes in this light switch over here, you know. I said, are you going to go knock a hole in the wall and trace it back to the pole and follow the pole all the way back down the street? Go all the way back till you find the, the spot to where the electricity is generated and pushed out? I said, no, we're not going to sit here in the dark until we do that. We're going to use the light switch and turn it on. Just, just trust the light. This, this, this light allows people to see Jesus. We need to shine the light to the world here. And by doing that, listen, the world will understand how much God loves them and what Jesus did to restore their relationship with Him. I keep going back to the young man in the, in the, in the restaurant. One old pastor said one time, man, when the Holy Spirit's moving and you know it and you understand what God's done, you, he said, you don't have to sing 99 verses of just as I am. He said, when the Holy Spirit hits you, he says, like electricity hitting a light bulb. He said, you know. That's the way it is when the world sees us and watches us. Doesn't mean that they'll surrender to him. But they know there's something different. You see, being light of the world actually carries the same purpose that Jesus had. When Jesus told them that, what a, what a, what a compliment. If you hadn't had a compliment in a, in, in a while, let me just give you one this morning. You are the light of the world if you're a child of God. You want to know how big a compliment that is? That's, that's, that's the exact same purpose. That's the exact same thing that Jesus called himself. You see, the Gospel of John tells us in, in chapter 1, verse 9, he said that the true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. He said in 8, verse 12, I am the light of the world. And whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. What a compliment to us to be even considered to be that. Look at verse 12, verse 46. Chapter 12, verse 46. I've come into this world as light so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. 1236 says, Put your trust in the light while you have it so that you may become sons of light. You see, it still means it's not about us. It's all about Jesus. 
It's all about God. It's about Him who, who is in us. We are to reflect the light of the world. We are to reflect His light. It's not our light. Colossians 1. Look at Colossians 1. If you can get to it. Colossians 1. Colossians 1 here. Verses 13. It says, For He that being Jesus has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son He loves in whom we have redemption for forgiveness of sin. That's what Jesus has done from us. He's taken us out of darkness and He's placed us in the light. Placed us in the light. We don't go back and forth between the light and the darkness. We are in the light. Salt is our function. Light is our identity. That's who you are in Christ. You're the light of the world. It may blow your mind this morning. You may have known that. Maybe you've forgotten that. You've got an important role in this world. You're precious to this world. You're precious to the plan of God. We're the light of the world. Listen, Jesus came to this earth that men, uh, to show men that he loved them. And he demonstrated what he was prepared to do to have a relationship with him. And he came into this dark, dark world. And when he did, this revelation was, was a piercing light. Crowds, crowds by the thousands and thousands and tens of thousands were following him. It's a piercing light. I wonder what type of light we are. What type of light are you in your sphere of influence? Monday morning at your workplace, do people dread when you come walking in? Oh, here comes the darkness. That's not good. It's not good. Wouldn't it be great if, they, if they'd come and say, I need to talk to you. I need some help. I need you to pray for me. I've got a neighbor. I had a guy in Arkansas come up to me. And, and we just owned that property less than two years or around it two years, whatever. And a neighbor come up to me and he said, hey, hey, John. John. I said, yeah, what is it? What is it, J.D.? He said, uh, you know all them blessings things you're talking about all the time? I said, yeah, 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 what about it? He's, I think I had one this week. <laughs> and he began to share this, this, this blessing, all right? And he got done. He said, was that a blessing? And I said, J.D., that was a blessing, guy. Yes, that was a blessing. And I said, God blessed you. He blessed you. Let me tell you, guys, it, it, it works. <laughs> Jesus knew what he was doing, man. 2 Corinthians 4, 6 says, For God made his light shine in your hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. You see, Jesus isn't here walking along beside us anymore teaching us that like he was the disciples. Matter of fact, he's left this earth and he's left us here to fill the role, to bring the light into the world. You know, thinking about that, I was thinking, what would it look like if we could see this earth in total darkness and just see the light of Jesus Christ and his followers? What would that look like? I just went on Google. The earth at night with lights. NASA's got it. Look at it when you go home. It's pretty cool. Now understand, that's not the followers of Jesus Christ, all right? But how amazing it would be if that was, all right? But there's a lot of the world that is dark, dark, dark. How bright is your light shining? Would your light be seen? 
He's given us a responsibility of bringing the world to the knowledge of God's love and God's forgiveness. That's what Jesus meant when he said that you're the light of the world. But you see, just like the uh, second part of 13 there, salt can lose its saltiness. Christians can come ineffective in their witness when they lose their purity. Same way we can do it when our light becomes ineffective. You know, are, you a, are you a dimmer Christian? You go through life and just dim it down? Are you a strobe light Christian? We need to bring the light to Jesus. Look at 14. You're light on a, uh, you are the light of the world. A city on a hill can't be hidden. city in Jesus' day usually built upon a hill. You could see it for miles away. It was visible. Verse 15. Neither do people put a light, a light a lamp and put it under a bowl. But instead they put it on its stand so that it gives light to everyone in the house. See, the purpose of lighting a lamp was so that everyone could see. If you put it under something, what did it do? It just defeated the purpose, right? It defeated the purpose of why it was lit. If we're not shining our light, it defeats the purpose. See, in the face of persecution, Christian might be tempted to hide that light. But Jesus says that if people don't know about your and my relationship, it defeats the purpose. Just think about that. That's your, that's your purpose that you're here. I love how one author put it. He said, that defeats the purpose of your layover. <laughs> I, I thought about that for a minute. I said, that, that's, that's exactly right. Listen, this earth is not our home. It's not our final destination for us as Christ followers. Right? Our final destination is in heaven with Jesus, a place the Bible calls paradise. If you're not a child of God, this is not your final destination. It's in a place the Bible calls hell, a place of destruction. Either way, this is not your final destination. It's your layover. Listen, we've got to allow others to be visible. We've got to allow others to see us. And I think that's, the no, that's, that's, that's where the emphasis is there. Allow the world to see our deeds. I think this dollar day is a great example of shining our light in this community. It's a great example. You see, the hope and the goal is, I should say the hope and the goal is, has been, and always will be, that they will give praise to God. You see, it's an important point that we are to catch, Right? The goal is not that people will say, what great Christians those people are at Crossridge. Look at all the wonderful things they do for the people in this community. Look at how honorable their lives are. But rather, the goal is that people will say, what a great God they serve. Amen? Guys, you... Don't miss your opportunity. Make the most of every opportunity to shine your light. The only way that that will happen is if you make it clear. Make it clear the reasons you're being good. Make it clear the reasons you want to help. So that others can see your good deeds. Look, if we don't give God the credit then we're not being the light to the world. We're failing at our purpose. We're not fulfilling the purpose that God intended for us to fulfill. You see, being salt and light means that our lives are to be characterized by goodness. Being light means that people are to be able to see that God is the source. People ought to know that God is the purpose. People ought to understand that God is the cause for our goodness. Peter says the same thing in his, his uh, uh, chapter 2, 11 and 12. He said, Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers, there's that, there's, that, <laughs> there's that talk again, it's not our final destination, to this world, abstain from the sinful desires of the world which war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans 
that though they accuse you of doing wrong, that they may see your good deeds and glorify God. People in this world may hate you for what you do, but when it's visible of all the good that you bring into this world, they have a hard time coming against you. You see, the emphasis is on people giving God the glory. When they clearly see our goodness. So we know that Jesus, what he says is that we ought to be a visible presence in this world. And we ought to attract people to God because they experience our goodness. You know, this morning... I think it's a good word for us who are children of Christ. God depends upon us. I don't know where you rate in that of self-evaluation there. I don't know how bright your beam is. God didn't call us to be a laser. God didn't call us to be a, a, a blinding to someone, over blind. He just says be salt and light so that people see Jesus in you. This is the way God people is supposed to act. You know, if you're here this morning, you're not a child of God. You've never surrendered your life to Christ. You know, I didn't say anything about how you become a disciple, about how you uh, receive that light. Well, you can do that this morning. This morning, you just need to understand that all goodness comes from Christ. All hope comes from Christ. I want to encourage you this morning to just turn from self. That means to repent. That means to turn away from self. Turn to Christ. That means you put your faith and trust in the person and the work of Jesus Christ, especially the work on the cross. A couple of weeks we'll be at that Resurrection Sunday to when we can celebrate wholeheartedly and as bright as we can celebrate our risen Savior. Do you see this morning, you have an opportunity this morning I'd love to share Christ with you. You've got to do is say, God, I believe you are who you say you are, Jesus. And I believe you did what you say you did, what the scriptures say you did. And you did it for me. And God, I need you. I want you to forgive me of my sins. And I want to thank you because the Bible says that if you ask God for forgiveness, he will forgive you and He will cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And I will live for you the best way that I know how from this point forward. There's something about making that public. You see, there's no, cert, no such thing as secret discipleship. Somebody much cleverer than me said that. Either secrecy will kill the discipleship or discipleship will kill the secrecy. When you come to Christ, you stand up and say, I have been reformed. I've been released. And most importantly, I've been redeemed. And you shine your light of Christ and make the most of every opportunity from that moment on. And I can guarantee you, you'll never regret it. If you need to know Christ, you come this morning, all right? Let's stand as they sing us an invitation, it won't be long, so don't put off. If you need to come, you come right now.